come in, come in. Oh, nice of you to drop round again. Do come and have a seat. There's a chair waiting for you. Well, I, uh, you see, I'm still with the, uh, the dragon pipe. Got it going rather, rather better this time. Nice meerschaum. Get a few rings, but not through each other. But I thought I'd have it because I so much enjoyed revisiting that classic first encounter with the dragon by Bilbo, revisiting that with you last time. I thought it might be fun by way of comparison and contrast and, you know, just to, to do it, to have the wonderful moment in C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which I have in this nice hardback with the Pauline Baines illustrations. Anyway, there's obviously a wonderful moment. Indeed, this whole dragon, indeed dragoning and undragoning, episode in, in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader featuring the unfortunate but uh, later rather improved Eustace, Eustace Clarence Scrub. And uh, we haven't got time for the whole thing, but I thought that just the, the opening sequence with the dragon is magnificent. So I thought we could have fun with that. Now, it was with a real thrill, and only in my late teens, that I discovered that Tolkien and Lewis actually knew each other. I didn't know. Of course they knew each other in my head. I mean... They'd been having conversations with each other and their imaginations and their worlds had been in kind of conversation with each other uh, in my head ever since I'd first had Tolkien's Hobbit and Lewis's Narnia stories read to me first by my dad and then later avidly read myself. So it was thrilling to know that they knew each other and encouraged each other and liked each other's works. Eventually, I picked up the year it came out 1978, this is the first edition. I picked up um, Humphrey Carpenter's book on the Inklings and found that they not only knew each other, but they met together in a pub called The Eagle and Child, which they nicknamed The Bird and Baby, and encouraged one another uh, and drank beer and smoked pipes. And um, I have had the pleasure of doing both of those things in the Eagle and Child, because um, that was in the days before it was banned. Anyway, we mustn't go on about that, because I want to read you the uh, this wonderful bit from The Voyage of the Dawn Trader, and I'll show you the... Um, I'll show you the, uh, the lovely Pauline Baines illustrations. So, to set the scene, you may remember that um, they're off on this voyage, the children have got into Narnia this time through a painting on the wall of a of a ship, a beautiful ship called the Dawn Treader. And they all end up with their cousin that they don't really get on with, Eustace Scrub. Um, or, or two of them end up on the on the boat and meet Prince Caspian, and it's on a series of wonderful adventures seeking the Outer East. Anyway, they have a terrible storm and they're driven onto an island which they know nothing about. And there's a huge amount of work to be done, getting all the torn sails off the ship and repairing them and getting out the old empty barrels that need to have fresh water from the island, all that kind of work. And Eustace doesn't like work, so he uh, he slips away and he gets lost. And he ends up in this remote valley where he hardly knows how to get back and there's been fog. And when the fog lifts, he realises he's completely alone and lost. And um, he's been making a thorough nuisance of himself uh, up to this point in the story. But of course, you know, they're, they're loyal and they miss him too. So he finds himself um, lost in this valley and there's a pool, so he's thirsty. So he's, he turned around again, thinking that at any rate, he'd better have a good drink from the pool first. But as soon as he had turned and before he had taken a step forward into the valley, he heard a noise behind him. It was only a small noise, but it sounded loud in that immense silence. It froze him dead still He stood for, uh, where he stood for a second. Then he slewed round his neck and looked. At the bottom of the cliff, a little on his left hand, was a low, dark hole, the entrance to a cave, perhaps. And out of this, two thin wisps of smoke were coming, and the loose stones just beneath the dark hollow were moving, and that was the noise that he'd heard. 
just as if something were crawling in the dark behind them. Something was crawling. Worse still, something was coming out. Edmund or Lucy or you would have recognised it at once. Uh, but Eustace had read none of the right books. The thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long lead-coloured snout, dull red eyes, no feather or fur, a long lithe body that trailed on the ground, legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's, cruel claws, bat's wings that made a rasping sound on the and uh, that made a rasping sound on the stones, yards of tail, and the lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things better if he had. I remember being so excited when my father was reading that, and I was going, it's a dragon, it's a dragon. Uh, that, of course, Eustace hasn't read the books about dragons. But perhaps if he had known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at this dragon's behaviour. It did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a stream of flame from its mouth. The smoke from its moss nostrils was like the smoke of a fire that will not last much longer. Nor did it seem to have noticed Eustace. It moved very slowly towards the pool, slowly and with many pauses. Even in his fear, Eustace felt that it was an old, sad creature. He wondered if he dared make a dash for the ascent, but it might look round if he made any noise. It might come more to life. Perhaps it was only shamming. Anyway, what is the use of trying to escape by climbing from a creature that could fly? Gosh, a great line. It reached the pool and slid its horrible scaly chin down over the gravel to drink. But before it had drunk, there came a great croaking or clanging cry, and after a few twitches and convulsions, it rolled round on its side and lay perfectly still with one claw in the air. A little dark blood gushed from its wide open mouth. The smoke from its nostrils turned black for a moment, then floated away. No more came. Oh, it's brilliant. So this was the. This is Pauline Ray Baines showing the wisps coming out, the wisps of smoke from the low cave, and there's the old dragon. It's just wonderfully done. For a long time, Eustace did not dare to move. Perhaps this was the brute's trick, the way it lured travellers to their doom. But one couldn't wait forever. He took a step nearer, then two steps, and halted again. The dragon remained motionless. He noticed, too, that the red fire had gone out of its eyes. At last he came up to it. He was quite sure now that it was dead. With a shudder, he touched it. Nothing happened. The relief was so great that Eustace almost laughed out loud. He began to feel as if he had fought and killed the dragon instead of merely seeing it die. He stepped over it and went to the pool for his drink, for the heat was getting unbearable. He was not surprised when he heard a peal of thunder. Almost immediately afterwards, the sun disappeared, and before he had finished his drink, big drops of rain were falling. Eustace was wet to the skin in half a minute and blinded with such rain as one never sees in Europe. There was no use trying to climb out of the valley as long as this lasted. He bolted for the only shelter in sight, the dragon's cave. There he lay down and tried to get his breath. Now, most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair. But as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That is why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns, and there seemed to be a great many round, flat things, and it all clinked, when he moved, I remember again my dad reading this. I was all, you know, right there, I was saying, Dad, Dad, treasure, treasure. Um, there was light enough at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course Eustace found it to be what any of us could have told him in advance. Treasure. There were crowns, those were the prickly things, coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates and gems. Eustace, unlike most boys, had never thought much about treasure. But he saw at once the use it would be in this new world into which he had so foolishly stumbled through the picture in Lucy's bedroom at home. They don't have any tax here, he said, and you don't have to give treasure to the government. With some of this stuff, I could have quite a decent time here, perhaps in Calamon, 
sounds like the least phony of these countries. I wonder how much I can carry. That bracelet now. Those things in it are probably diamonds. I'll slip that onto my own wrist. Too big, but not, not if I push it right up here above my elbow. Then fill my pockets with diamonds. That's easier than gold. I wonder if this infernal rain, when this infernal rain is going to let up. He got into a less uncomfortable part of the pile where it was mostly coins and settled down to wait. But a bad fright when once it's over, and especially a bad fright following a mountain walk, leaves you tired. Eustace fell asleep. And then, of course, the story switches over to all of them realising he's gone and calling for him and actually being loyal. And even though, you know, he's, you know, despised and insulted them, they, he's, they belong, he belongs to them and they, they you know, they're part, he's part of their fellowship, so they're looking for him. He doesn't know that. So then we'll flash back to the story. Meanwhile, Eustace slept and slept. What woke him was a pain in his arm. The moon was shining in at the mouth of the cave and the bed of treasures seemed to have grown much more comfortable. In fact, he could hardly feel it at all. He was puzzled by the pain in his arm at first, but presently it occurred to him that the bracelet which he had shoved up above his elbow had become strangely tight. His arm must have swollen while he was asleep. It was his left arm. He moved his right arm in order to feel his left, but stopped before he had moved it an inch and bit his lip in terror, for just in front of him, and a little on his right, where the moonlight fell clear on the floor of the cave, he saw a hideous shape moving. He knew that shape. It was a dragon's claw. We have to say that word. Yes, it, was. it was a dragon's claw. It had moved as he moved his hand and become still when he stopped moving his hand. Oh, what a fool I've been, thought Eustace. Of course, the brute had a mate and it's lying beside me. For several minutes, he did not dare to move a muscle. He saw two thin columns of smoke going up before his eyes, black against the moonlight, just as there had been smoke coming up from the other dragon's nose before it died. This was so alarming that he held his breath. The two columns of smoke vanished. Of course, you can think as a reader, you're getting it before he lets you know he's giving you all the hints. When he could hold his breath no longer, he let it out stealthily. Instantly, two jets of smoke appeared again. But even yet, he had no idea of the truth. Presently, he decided that he would edge very cautiously to his left and try to creep out of the cave. Perhaps the creature was asleep, and anyway, it was his only chance. But of course, before he edged to the left, he looked to the left. Oh, horror! There was a dragon's claw on that side, too. No one will blame Eustace if at this moment he shed tears. He was surprised at the size of his own tears as he saw them splashing onto the treasure in front of him. They also seemed strangely hot. Steam went up from them. But it was no good crying. He must try to crawl out from between the two dragons. He extended his right arm. The dragon's foreleg and claw on his right went through exactly the same motion. Then he thought he would try his left. The dragon limb on that side moved too. Two dragons, one on each side, mimicking whatever he did. His nerve broke and he simply made a bolt for it. There was such a clatter and rasping and clinking of gold and grinding of stones as he rushed out of the cave that he thought they were both following him. He daren't look back. He rushed to the pool. The twisted shape of the dead dragon lying in the moonlight would have been enough to frighten anyone, but now he hardly noticed it. His idea was to get to the water, get into the water. But just as he reached the edge of the pool, two things happened. First of all, it came over him like a thunderclap that he had been running on all fours. And why on earth had he been doing that? And secondly, as he bent towards the water, he thought for a second that yet another dragon was staring up at him out of the pool. But in an instant, he realised the truth. The dragon face in the pool was his own reflection. There was no doubt of it. It moved as he moved. It opened and shut its mouth as he opened and shut his. He had turned into a dragon while he was asleep, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy, dragonish thoughts in his heart. He had become a dragon himself. That explained everything. The, there'd been no two dragons beside him in the cave. The claws to right and left had been his own right and left claw. The two columns of smoke had been coming from his own nostrils. As for the pain in his left arm, or what had been, what had been his left arm, he could now see it that what had happened by squinting his left eye. The bracelet, which had fitted nicely on the upper arm of a boy, 
was far too small for the thick, stumpy foreleg of a dragon. It had sunk deeply into his scaly flesh, and there was a throbbing bulge on each side of it. He tore at the place with his dragon's teeth, but he could not get it off. In spite of the pain, his first feeling was one of relief. There was nothing to be afraid of any more. He was a terror himself, and nothing in the world but a knight, and not all of those, would dare to attack him now. He could get even with Caspi and an Edmund now. But the moment he thought this, he realised he didn't want to. He wanted to be friends. He wanted to get back among humans and talk and laugh and share things. He realised that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race. An appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that all the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he always supposed. He longed for their voices. He would have been grateful for a kind word even from Reaper Cheap. When he thought of this, the poor dragon that had been Eustace lifted up its voice and wept. A powerful dragon, crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley, is a sight and a sound hardly to be imagined. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's um, Pauline Bain's beautiful picture of the poor dragon that was Eustace crying. I remember reading, even as a child, reading that last sentence with great satisfaction. A powerful dragon crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and sound hardly to be imagined. That's a wonderful piece of writing. So, of course, there's much more of the adventure, and I'm, I'm sure you know it, and there's the interesting story of Eustace changes, as it were, a bit more on the inside, but eventually, happily, is able to change um, back on the outside and to be, in uh, Lewis's beautifully invented word, undragoned, though he needs help to do that. He needs the help <laughs> of Aslan to do that. But anyway, I just thought it would be fun to... Um, uh, my own dragon's claw pipe has gone out rather like the fire in the dragon there, but unlike the fire in the old dragon, this can be re-illumined. Anyway, it's good of you to drop round. It's a great pleasure for me to revisit these classics of my childhood and see that perhaps um, the child in me is still still alive and still full of wonder and marvel. So anyway, thanks for coming round.